robot disguised as an alien. Because inside he's a robot. I think he's an alien who uses a robotic body. Who, what am I? Not even close. <laughs> it's like not even close. At least sometimes my team will just be like. <laughs> yeah. Oh, awesome. Oh, let's get some music going here. Gotta get Jamie pumped up here. Can't wait. Okay. It's pretty good. Yeah. I like it. And then and then we could we could stop and play more alien alien versus robot. Alien robots, fun game. Janet's watching, it's our game. All right, all right. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Founder Sessions. Uh, I'm really excited this week because we have a special guest, Jamie, who, uh, Jamie Coakley, we're going to be formal a little bit, which we're not normally. Yeah. Uh, who is both friend, colleague, superstar. Thank you. Amazingness. So, hi, I just set incredibly high expectations <laughs> yeah, for you. I'm sorry. It's yeah. not that so great. So, do not let us down. Okay. Uh, so, Jamie, why don't you give a quick introduction of yourself and then we can set some, some ground rules for what we want to kind of cover here. Okay, cool. Um, so, I am the CEO of a company known as 20 Pine here in New York. Uh, my background is primarily in sales and recruitment. Uh, formerly, I ran the New York office of Betts Recruiting. We're a sales recruiting agency. 20 Pine actually does specifically Salesforce.com recruiting, so another niche market. Uh, but I'm from the Pacific Northwest, grew up in California, in Las Vegas, weirdly enough. Uh, and I've been in New York for three years and absolutely love it here. Yeah, a lesson we learned before this is never ask her where she's from. <laughs> a lot of places. I moved a lot of places. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think give, given that context, sure. it, it, you know, it probably makes sense to talk people. Mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as just a coverage point for people who are looking to hire. Sure. Uh, team building. I think for you, scaling is a really important subject matter I would think about. I know we have a number of things we'll talk here that will cover that, but I'm just trying to you yeah. know, provide some, some high level subject matter that people can, can value, can learn from, um, that you can bring to the table. And even a bit, because you weren't a, necessarily a founder. No. So the challenges uh, for a CEO who came in sure. and took over from a founder. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, why don't we talk a little bit of recruiting? Okay. Why don't, you know, first, you know, I don't think most people understand what a, a recruiting business is like, right? Okay. A recruiting agency. You know, so they probably engage with it, they know when they pay fees. Sure. Um, what's it like being in the business? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually fell into recruitment uh, five years ago. I was in a sales job and I worked at Yelp right out of school, cut my teeth in cold calling, $100 a day. And I loved what I did from like a team perspective, super collaborative, competitive, hitting quota, just like that energy in the office. And I didn't necessarily love what I was selling to local business owners. Um, and so I felt like everyone else who I talked to that's in recruitment, you fall into recruitment. You don't necessarily wake up and want to be a recruiter one day. And I fell into recruitment uh, by meeting my former CEO at the Super Bowl really random encounter and signed an offer 10 days later and it provided with for me really young in my career the ability to sell and connect with people and be competitive and have everything I liked hitting quota all that stuff with the combination of like the warm and fuzzy side of things which is helping people find jobs and so I think from a business standpoint that's kind of the first on the outside people see like oh recruiters you're in HR you help people find jobs like that is probably the biggest uh, mis misconception that's out there, we help companies scale. And yeah. so from a business standpoint, what, what I didn't realize I would fall in love with really young was you know, making a first sales hire placement or making a really you know, significant salesforce.com hire for a company, you help businesses realize their full potential. Yeah. You help them reach certain goals by either you know, enabling their teams to better access data or just leverage the technologies that they, they've bought and they've invested in. So there's this really rewarding experience of not only helping people find jobs and being a career coach and this is how you interview, but on the flip side, like making companies grow. And having been in the business now for six years, I've seen companies we've helped hire that have gone through exits, that have gotten you know, Series B, Series C funding rounds, and that's a super rewarding just experience overall. Um, I think the challenge is, is that you have to understand from a business standpoint, what are the challenges of your customer, like really deeply. And I think one hire, even though one, one Salesforce developer could be really great in one role, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be great in another. Um, there's a lot of just consultation that happens when you first meet a customer or a client and say, okay, what do you think you need? That's kind of how we start. 
and through you know a full discovery and understanding what their needs are, you kind of uncover you actually don't need like a two hundred thousand dollar a year developer. You need someone for a two month contract to help you get some work done, and then potentially a different type of hire down the line. So, I think that kind of is also a rewarding experience of just like uncovering the needs of the people that we work with. Um, recruiters also have a really bad reputation in the market. We're known to be like sharky and not call you back. Um, people have probably, if you are on LinkedIn, you've received emails. They're like, this has nothing to do with me. Like, to be clear, Jamie's only at most 70% of those things. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> um, I think you know the reason that 20 Pine is doing very well and the reason my past companies had, had done really well is because we take a totally different approach to not only the candidate but the client side and you know every interaction counts and so our whole mission at 20 Pine is to really restore integrity to recruitment to build sustainable teams which I think when people get on the phone with us they're often very surprised they're like wow like I've never had someone ask me what I want to do in five years like so if, if that's a great question if your client mm -hmm. right so first for you guys your primary client is the companies themselves yes. so if you're a company if you're a founder you're an executive and you're gonna engage with a green firm what should they know? What are the top three, four tips that you should that they should be aware of before picking, uh, you know, a recruiting firm? To work yeah, with? I think understanding one like has this recruitment firm ha had success in the past working on placements that you're looking to hire? Um, if they haven't, like, what is their approach to that? If they're like, we haven't worked on this type of role, but these are our thoughts. Here's some candidates we came to mind. Like, if they're taking a proactive approach outside of maybe their comfort zone, they potentially could deliver. And so you have to kind of evaluate how they're interacting with you. The advice I also give to companies is like, recruiters need to be asking great questions. Like, as an agency, we become an extension of your company. So we, our values have to be in line. How we operate has to be, you know, similar. And so I think that's something that not a lot of companies do is they see recruiters as this like resume feeder, like uh, send me a bunch of your people. Like that is not what we do. We are yeah. consultants. I would rather send you three people over the course of a week and you hire one of those people than send you 30 and we get nowhere. So make sure when you're evaluating an agency, like listen to the types of questions that they're asking you. Is yeah. it, are they going down a form and like, okay, do you want three to five of years of experience? Is this the comp range? Rather than like, what's your founding story? Like, what are you guys all about? That's a really important question to understand from like a 30,000 foot view. What is your company's mission? Because that says a lot about an organization and how their culture is run. And if a recruiter's not asking those questions, they're not gonna be able to find new candidates that fit that. Yeah. Um, and then third, I would say like the follow up, like is this recruiter making you their top priority? Yeah. When you, you know, when the, you get off a call with a recruiter, do they send you a follow up email? Thanks for your time. Here are the things we talked about. Here's what you can expect from me in the next 24 to 48 hours. Like, because if they're not doing it with you, they're, they're definitely not going to do it when you have a search live, yeah. right? And so you want to know that I'm your number one priority, even if you have a number of other searches going on. Like, how are you managing your time and prioritizing my needs? Because if you're not going to deliver in the way that I need you to, this partnership's never going to work out. So, so now you're engaged with the client. How about the people sides? Mm -hmm. I think this is even useful for screening purposes. If people aren't even engaged with recruiters, how to look at people? Sure. You know, what, do, you, what, do you have a process? You know, how do you think about it? Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of companies make the mistake of we need to hire someone. Okay, we need an account executive, or we need a Salesforce admin. Let's start interviewing Salesforce. By the way, guys, I'm gonna ask Jamie. Jamie's getting excited. She sped up a little bit there. Oh, so I'm asking her to be a little bit slower for slow us. Slow way down. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I think the the first and foremost thing that you should do as a company is create a list of criteria that you're looking for. So how are we going to evaluate each individual based okay. on, you know, culture fit might be one of the things you're looking at. You have to know what your culture is. Yeah. Like, is it intense? Is it collaborative? Is it transparent? Is it, you know, hard working, work hard, play hard? Like, you have to understand and everyone interviewing has to understand the criteria as well. Mm -hmm. um, create that list. We have four to five things that we evaluate internally. Um, every single hire, it's almost like a scorecard, like one through five, how much are you of this? And if there's you know anything that's a two or a three and you're not ranking high, like that affects your ultimate score, right? And we don't hire anyone above a certain score. And what that's allowed us to do, and I recommend to all of our clients creating the same type of criteria, is it allows you to have a benchmark where it's an unbiased evaluation of a candidate. 
I think a lot of people make like gut check hires. They're like, well, we really like this person. We work at a startup. I would have a beer with him. Like having a beer with someone is not going to grow your company. That is, that is important. I don't want to work next to someone who sucks, but like that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be a bad fit just because you maybe don't want to spend all your time with them during yeah. the week. Although there is a line people should draw culturally sure. where they're thinking, if I have to sit in a room all day with this guy, I may not, I may Absolutely. hate myself. Like I may start like faking injuries to like get out of the room or something, right? Absolutely. Like, I hope drinking, it's not drinking, that bad. Drinking castor oil, like oh my stomach, but guess I, I gotta think, go work from home. I think companies should, should not be afraid to hire outside their culture when they're hiring yeah. for maybe a role, say if you're a sales organization and you need to hire your first accounting person. Like the 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 probability of you finding a really salesy accountant like is is low. So yeah. like hire the best person for the job, yeah. but you can't go and you can't start sprinting towards the interview process and your yeah. hire unless you have your criteria that you're looking for. And I think sometimes this comes in the form of a job description, yeah. but like it's deeper than that. It's a well, deep understanding of the questions you ask. Yeah almost like robotic in a sense. Like you need to make sure every single person evaluating certain aspects is having the same conversation so that candidate A and candidate B were asked the same thing yep. and you can assess, okay, well they said this about their past experience. He didn't really have that great of an example. Um, it helps you yeah. make better, smarter hires, but if you don't have a repeatable interview process, yeah. you're already failing. And, and that includes judging on the technical skill set and then judging on these cultural aspects, many of which you've covered. Absolutely. Which are important. And those things, you could be a salesy organization, but if you're a work, like call it a work hard, play hard organization, and then you bring somebody who's like, I kind of just want to be here nine to five and like get home and sure. like, not, like not embed myself in this place. Because I think when I hear work hard, play hard, I'm thinking your whole, like you're embedding yourself in this as a livelihood, mm -hmm. right? It's like not, not just from a financial standpoint, but from a social standpoint. Yeah. Right? I think it's just about digging deep. And like yeah. when someone says, when a candidate is talking to a recruiter on my team and they say, I really want to work at a company with great culture. We ask five to 10 more questions. Yeah. What is culture to you? What is good culture? Is it work hard, play hard? Is it leave at five, work-life balance? Is it accessibility to leadership team? Is it, you know, work from home autonomy, flexibility? Like culture means means so many different things, but it's the company's values that dictate how you behave as an organization. So. Yeah. There's a lot to that. So yeah. I think also just like digging deep with every candidate, like, oh, I want good culture. Like, don't stop there. Keep yeah. going. Um, tech assessments and things like that are a little bit more white and black, but like you have to vet out certain capabilities and ask for examples in people's past work, ask for references. Like yeah. I will check two references from a candidate when we hire them. I'll probably do three to four more backdoor references. Yeah, and when you, say, when you say backdoor references, what do you mean by that? That means, so an inter someone's interviewing with me, I'm gonna go on LinkedIn, look at their profile, see who I'm connected with or who maybe our like second or third degree connections are, and I'm gonna shoot messages off to those people and say, hey, do you know Jonathan? Have you worked with him? What was that experience like? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna find some common thread so that I can get a reference, because no one sends a bad reference. Like when you yeah. send your references, hopefully, yeah. those are people that are gonna speak very positively on your behalf, yep. it doesn't always happen, so like prep your references. And so I think I don't actually judge a reference by what they say all the time about a person. I judge how quickly they get back to me. Interesting. So how quickly are you going to get on the phone with me? Yeah. I actually think, you know, when we do reference calls, one of the most important things is the questions you ask, mm -hmm. right? So you could be like, are they good at their job? Did you enjoy working with them? It's of course they're going to say yes to the reference more, but you know, more important than that is, okay, walk me through stuff they did. Mm -hmm. Right or the kind of projects they did, and then see if they align with the stuff you're doing. That's right. Because if you think the whole uh, your whole your whole belief, your whole theory is that oh, there's alignment, and suddenly mm -hmm. you realize, wow, they just described all this work that we don't do, and we're trying to hire somebody to do this work over here. Yeah. Then you know it's not a good fit, and I think going that layer deep on references and having thoughtful questions is really important. The th yeah, the thoughtful question piece is so important. And there's yeah. a question I stole actually from Travis Owsley, who's the former head of talent at Managed by Q. He did a reference check with me, and I was like, this is. An amazing question and it's he asks the reference person okay I hire this individual say in six months they don't work out why yeah what was the reason I fired them and it like puts the, the reference person on the spot and usually like great candidates are like I I can't think of one reason maybe your company sucks or like yeah. they kind of put it back on you but sometimes you'll get the 
well, maybe, you know, they, their, their ego got in the way. Or maybe yeah. they weren't collaborative with the team and they kind of feels like they're fishing, but there's something under there that you can dig into. Yeah. So think of thoughtful questions that are, are outside the norm of like, what was your experience like with this person? Like, it's gonna, they're gonna say great. They're gonna say they recommend hiring them again, especially if they provided the, the reference. Yeah. So like, think of those questions before you make those calls for sure. Does recruiting for tech roles, and, and you, you sounds like you were in tech literally from the get go. Mm -hmm. Is recruiting for tech roles or startup roles different than other companies? <laughs> yes, it is. It's different for every company, uh, regardless of the position. And at Twenty Point, we work with like three person startups that are hiring, you know, their first consultant to come in and help them build their Salesforce instance out or even implement it all the way up to Fortune 100s. Salesforce is industry agnostic. So it's kind of this weird art ideal customer profile is like off the charts all over the place. Um, and so every it, it's it's so different for each person because the needs of that client are different at the time that you speak to them. They may be different a year later. Um, and so you have to constantly be requalifying and like rediscovering what the client's needs are and as well as like what the candidate wants because what the candidate wanted three months ago, they might not want six months later. Life happens, right? It's, it's really crazy working with people because so many changes can take place in yeah. someone's life that affect your motivations and what you're looking for. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of, it's a lot, it's very different. If you had a, a top list of reasons people probably don't work out in jobs, right? That people, be, you know, that you might say, this is a pretty good list to keep top of mind as you're hiring, things to avoid. I think from like a really easy one is just like the person didn't, doesn't do what they said they did, which is like there's, that is so avoidable, yeah. like through reference checks, through, we actually have people when we hire internally do two take home assignment exercises where you're either, you know, calling my cell phone and leaving a voicemail. I want to hear what you sound like on the phone and under pressure as like a 20 pine recruiter. How would you approach that? And I also want to see you write an email as if you were prospecting me. Yeah. I have you do the job to make sure like you're capable of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with tech recruiting, we'll have a tech assessment. You either pass or you fail. Sometimes clients will ask for providing samples of their work, which can get tricky because, you know, intellectual property and things like that. But the right candidate is gonna do homework if they're excited about the opportunity. Yeah. They're they're going to find a way to provide you with examples. Um, so I think it shows initiative on that part. But definitely, like, can they do the job? For some reason, it's it's common. It's a silly mistake, but it happens. I think the majority of time, the people we place, they work out. Like Twenty Pine is a really great. Once someone accepts an offer, they start. And then, you know, once they get going, they stay there for a long time. Our mission is to build sustainable teams. And they, I think why that happens is because we ask really tough questions on both sides. We're constantly probing and figuring out why this won't work out. So when it does, we're sure of it. Um, but then there's like crazy stories, right? Like people yeah. don't show up on their first day. Like, yeah. who are you? That's not normal. Uh, counter offers. So one thing that you can do to avoid that is as a hiring manager, ask the current, you know, the candidate, if you were to leave, like, would you, and they presented you a counter offer, would you consider that? What would it take for you to stay at your current company? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of recruiting people and hiring managers in general don't ask that question. We ask it on our first call with candidates. What's, yeah. what's going on? Why are you on the phone with yeah. me today? And they say, oh, I hate my boss. You know, he's, he's really micromanagey. I don't like him. It's like, okay, well, can you move to a different team? Right? Like, have you tried to solve the problem internally? It builds a lot of trust with us as an agency of like, hey, I don't just want to like send your resume everywhere. I want what's best for you. Yep. Who have you talked to about this issue? Have you asked for more money? You'd be so surprised how many people are like, no. Okay, well, let's do this. Let's hop off the phone. Why don't you put a one-on-one -on, -one on your boss's calendar tomorrow, ask for more money. I can help coach you on how to have that conversation. If it doesn't go well, let's talk about opportunities. If it does, yeah. Great. Nobody's been Congrats. fired for asking for more <laughs> money, right? No. So yeah. try to solve the problem before you start interviewing because and, and, and encourage as a hiring manager, if you're hiring or as a recruiter, encourage your candidates to try to solve the problem too because you just end up not wasting a lot of time and ultimately you end up building better relationships because you're doing what's best for the person. Yeah. So we've talked mostly about people, about recruiting, 
team team building. Let's talk about being a CEO. Okay. Right. So you wear a lot of hats. How do you manage your time? <laughs> what does your day to day look like? What drives you nuts? Uh, my day to day is packed. Um, I'm in back to backs in meetings, and so actually my team got an email late last night that said we're clearing the calendar. It's end of month, start of Q4. Like I'm going to be on the floor. So I think it's just being like better at prioritization. Mm -hmm. And even when you look at your calendar in the morning, you're like, oh my gosh, today is gonna be so insane. Like, is that the right thing for your business? Yes. It might not be, so do something about it. Yeah. Um, being a CEO, I think, has been super interesting. I don't feel like much has changed. There's just more on my plate um, and more pressure to like make sure that everyone is happy and delivering and being successful. But like, what keeps me up at night is just, you know, are we making the right decisions by growing in this way? Right, like how do I get the team that I have now? Everyone joined a startup to have a fast upward mobility and, and growth in their career for the most part. I don't know why you would join a really small company if you didn't want to grow. Um, so like, are we providing my team with every opportunity possible to scale, right? Um, those are things that, that definitely keep me up. So you talk about prioritization. Yeah. Um, first of all, Jamie keeps stealing my questions from my list over Sorry. here. Sorry. So that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. We're having a great conversation. You kind of had like a three-part question though. I so laid out. I threw it out. It's not my you. fault. So uh, that's on me. <laughs> are you good at saying no? Not always, and that's yeah. it's definitely a huge weakness. Um, I think I I have like a very serving type of leadership style. I think ultimately it comes down to like one of the things I do every night is I write a daily plan. It's the silliest thing. It's one of the first things I train on my junior recruiters to do is like write out what you're going to do today and you want to have the things at the top that you do first be the closest to the money, right? Like where's the first deal? You know, is this someone in an interview or is this person a first candidate call? Like you need to be prioritizing things that are closer to deals or a sales culture. Yeah. Um, but I think that kind of prioritization helps me like focus in on stuff. You have to say no, right? Like, yeah. You're gonna not please everyone. I think that's really hard. And I think as a CEO or any type of leader, as a sales manager, as a team lead, the lowest, like as low as the totem pole goes, you have to be great at delegating. And so pulling someone into a room and being like, I need you. I'm having a tough time. I don't have time for this. Can you help me with this? You are so great at it. It would mean a lot to me. It would mean a lot to that person if you could help them. And I think that's kind of where we get this in, this culture of empowerment of the team stepping up to do more than just their job. That's again yeah. why they joined a startup. They want to wear many hats. Um, but if you're not delegating and you're holding everything in and doing everything at once, you're going to fail. Yeah. You're also going to burn out, and that's real. Um, so just you know, be mindful. I think that's super important. Well, let's end it on on one note, which is what two or three pieces of advice would you give founders overall? Uh, or CEOs, or people in a similar role, that you would give them in terms of you know, how to find success? How to find success. I think, one, like don't sweat the small or the big stuff. Like You're not most likely not making a decision today that's gonna like affect the future of your business and like have it crumble tomorrow. Like Fires aren't truly fires, even though for you, it feels like maybe the world is ending in that moment. Like Everything is fixable, like yeah. everything. So don't freak out. Um, and some fires you shouldn't put out right away because it's not the most yeah. important thing. Yeah, or like you're gonna have an emotional reaction to it. So like take a minute, like table it and be like, let's come back to this. And so I think just like being okay with failing and knowing that it's like not the end of the world because I think as a founder, you're most likely putting that type of pressure on yourself because you put yourself in that position. You're a rare breed. Um, I think too, just like prioritization and delegation time management like ties together. Yeah. If you're not doing the things that are most important to your business now, not only now, but later, like you need to be carving out time to be strategic because you're probably in a reactive role with a small team if you're a startup. And if you're not like taking time to have committee meetings or think strategically about a business division, you're gonna not, you're just, you're never gonna get to it. It's yeah. gonna keep moving. One thing I do is on my calendar, if I move something, like that time that I had to think, I'll literally change the invite to second attempt. So it like holds me accountable when you're on like the third or fourth attempt. You're like, oh girl, like you better get to this. Like yeah. this is being moved and moved and moved. And also figure out personally, why are you moving it? Yes. Are you avoiding, is there something you're avoiding? Absolutely. Right, or, or have you committed yourself to too many things and this is the thing you think you could pull off and the real answer is pull off something else because you're overcommitted so you can make this happen. Yeah. Um, and I think the third is just enjoy the wins. I'm yeah. super bad at this. I am like the type A, set the goal, need to hit it. And I forget when I hit it to like pause and enjoy that moment. And so 
when you don't do that, your team's not doing that, yeah. and that's how you lose people. So like pause, like take them out for a beer, celebrate, even if it wasn't a great week, if there were things that were good, like celebrate those wins. Yeah. Um, and pause and like enjoy it because if you're a founder or a CEO, you've done something right. And like, again, the world's not going to end if things go wrong. Just like enjoy it. What are your What were your, some of the favorite ways, either when you're running a company or when you've been on a team, where you how you've celebrated wins? What are some of those like memorable moments? <laughs> I think it depends. So it depends, right? So as a good leader, you should know how your team wants to be recognized. Because yeah. I have a few members on my team, and they're probably watching right now turning bright red. Hey guys. <laughs> and they don't like to be recognized publicly. Yeah. And so maybe it's a card that you leave on their desk, right? Yeah. Like a really special note of like, when you did this, you took our team, our company, our brand, our vision and mission to the next level. And like that little tiny note made their day. Yeah. And so I think those moments, honestly, more so than like spraying champagne on someone when they close a huge deal, if that happens, like those thoughtful little moments of recognition, I think are much more special than like the big parties that you know, you can throw for people. Yeah. One of my favorites is we, we took our team to go play laser tag. Oh, so fun. I'm also a, a massive type A, so my team can tell you how insane <laughs> I get when we do things like this. <laughs> like um, hyper competitive. But I was not the only one doing it. Like, I, there were people, like, literally, you know, with the gun, like, crawling on the ground. Oh, my gosh. Even though, to be fair, you could just walk up and shoot them. It was just amazing that people Passion. really got into That's it. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Shout out to me and Meryl on that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, before we cut off, thank you, Nam Lee, the man by the camera. He's always uh, killing it. Jamie, thank you so much for, thank for joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And guys, we'll see you next week and uh, you know, look forward to, to more learnings. <laughs>